I'm Senator John McCain. You're about to be introduced to a group of extraordinary men who bravely step forward to serve their country in its time of greatest need. Each of these men willingly volunteered for a perilous one-way mission where the only thing they knew for sure was that they might not be coming home. As an aviator, I fully understand the bond that these men have shared and how for the past 63 years, that bond has continued to be strengthened at their annual reunions. This film is not only about an important mission in military history, but it's about a group of heroes and their long-standing relationships, deep respect, and abiding loyalty for one another. Men of one heart, I give you Raiders Remember. Hello, my name is Rick Avery. On April 18, 1942, a group of 80 brave American airmen took off from the deck of the aircraft carrier Hornet in planes just like this one, on a one-way mission to retaliate for what President Roosevelt called a day which will live in infamy, the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. 16 B-25 bombers, each with a five-man crew, set off that stormy day to strike back at the very heart of Japan, Tokyo. This historic mission that would later change the course of the war in the Pacific was led by America's greatest pilot, Jimmy Doolittle. The men he led that day would later become known simply as Doolittle's Raiders. Three Raiders made the ultimate sacrifice that day. And for the past 63 years, surviving Raiders have come together annually to pay tribute to their own. We invite you to join us as we introduce some of these true American heroes, relive moments of the raid itself, learn what the men were thinking during the mission, and what they think about it today. There are 17 Raiders left now of the original 80. Nine of them are attending this reunion. So no goblets will be turned down. As their historian, I'm often asked about the origin of these goblets. They were given to the Raiders in 1959 during their reunion that year by citizens of the city of Tucson, Arizona. They were flown to the Air Force Academy afterwards and presented there by General Doolittle for safekeeping and display between reunions. They've been brought to each reunion since then by outstanding Academy cadets who have been selected for this honor. And the cadets selected this year are cadets Ian Bertram and Matthew Hopkins. Then flew out in a, an old C-47, got our briefings, and as we were coming back to our airplane, the other fellow with me asked the driver to take us to the Air Force Academy Museum. 
Well, at that time, there was a small museum right by the main gate. And uh, I asked him why he wanted to go. And he said, well, I want to see our goblets. And I said, what goblets? What are you talking about? And he said, well, I was one of Doolittle's Tokyo Raiders. His name was Dick Knobloch. And he said, I want to see they're on display here, and I want to see what they look like. So we entered this little museum. And there at the end of the room, under a beautiful blue light, were these 80 silver goblets. Some of them turned up, some of them turned down. And I asked him the story about that. And he said, well, every year these goblets are brought to the reunion site. And we drink a toast to those who have gone. And if anybody has gone in the middle of the year between our reunions, then at that reunion we turn his goblet upside down. We have a very solemn ceremony. Crew number one, pilot Doolittle, co-pilot Cole, navigator Potter, bombardier Bramer, gunner Leonard. Crew number five, pilot Jones, Bombardier, True Love, Gunner, Mansk. Crew number 11, Pilot, Greening, Bombardier, Birch, Gunner, Gardner. I wish they were here to talk to, um, because uh, that generation, uh, we're losing them so quickly. And uh, they could, the stories that they could tell and what they did, uh, I, I think is important that the people understand what they did. And, and I'm not sure everybody has that, understands that concept. I mean, the fact that uh, they did something incredibly novel off of an aircraft carrier and uh, took off 200 miles farther out than they were originally supposed to, knowing full well that they probably weren't going to make it to the airfields in China, um, just demonstrates to me an incredible honor, courage, and really commitment to the cause. And, uh, I just wish, uh, as I'm reading, those, as I was reading those names off, I wish that they were still here so that we could speak to them. Number one, Lieutenant Colonel Richard E. Cole, co-pilot for Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. After the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt was uh, hot on the trot to pay him back, and uh, he kept needling the chiefs of staff, uh, we've got to do something. And there was a Navy captain by the name of Blow uh, that one day that uh, was flying in a Navy airplane over Norfolk uh, Naval Air Station. And uh, he saw a, a B-25 take off of the runway. And on the runway were markers markings that the Navy has been using for uh, their training. He got the idea, I wonder if U.S. Army airplanes could take off from a carrier. Tung Sheng Lu is an honorary raider 
who helped crews in their escape from the Japanese in China. Their volunteer is a, is a truly volunteer. Uh, you may have uh, read or heard that when they were training in England, they were told, don't tell anybody, even your wife, what you're doing here. Now, they did not know they're headed for Tokyo until the carrier Hornet passed Golden Gate, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Major General David M. Jones, pilot, crew number five. Were you scared when you jumped out? Hell yes, you were. Crew number six, Lieutenant Colonel Chase J. Nielsen, navigator. My pilot was one that was executed. Crew number seven, Staff Sergeant David J. Thatcher, engineer gunner. Hanging on and, and laying against the Bombay, the back of the Bombay, and when we hit, and then that first I remember it came to, and the the water was the water was rushing into bottom plane. Major Thomas C. Griffin, navigator. Of course, we didn't very much think that when we took off because I, I'm a navigator and we weren't gonna reach China. We were gonna ditch someplace in the China Sea out of gas. Master Sergeant Edwin W. Horton, engineer gunner. The thoughts that I had when I took off from the carrier, I don't know. It, you concentrate pretty much on things at hand, you know. You don't look too far ahead. Or at least I didn't. Colonel William M. Bauer, pilot. You can have some thoughts about people that aren't here and have been. You see the cup of somebody that you knew well turned over. And then every, every once in a while we see somebody that we hadn't seen for a long, long time. And that's helpful. Then crew number 11 next, Lieutenant Colonel Frank A. Kapler, Navigator. You don't have to go if you don't want to, but they said uh, your chances of coming back on this project will be about 50-50. Crew number 16, Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Height, co-pilot. Of course, I'm, I, I always feel a little sad by uh, the moment of knowing the ones to those who have gone, you know, and uh, we were, we had been really a pretty close group of guys. And it's, uh, I think I always uh, say a prayer of thanksgiving for the guy when they're gone. We'll now conduct the ceremony. Well, for me, I don't know about other people, but uh, uh, when I read the names or listen to the names, immediately I visualize the individual and uh, some of his mannerisms and, uh, you know, who he was. Normal roll call, fellow Raiders. Crew number one, James H. Doolittle. Here. Yeah. Henry A. Potter. Here. Fred A. Bramer. Here. Paul J. Leonard. Here. Crew number two, Travis Hoover. Here. William N. Fuchu. Here. Richard Carl Wilder. Here. Douglas B. Radney. Here. Crew number three, 
Robert M. Gray. Here. Jacob E. Mack. Here. Aiden E. Jones. Here. Leland J. Dieter. Here. It is the tradition that uh, uh, leaders like General Zulito would like to call and uh, uh, get a response from uh, from his his men, and it it is uh, uh, whether living or passed away, and uh, it's it's a a, a close that's uh, like a, like a family members. So we all had that that feeling during these roll calls. Don Fitzmaurice. Here. William J. Dieter. Here. Scout crew number seven. Ted W. Lawson. Here. Here. Dean Davenport. Here. It makes you go back because I remember those fellows who may have died over between reunions. And it certainly makes you um, reflect on them and their lives and, uh, and the fact that there are, <coughs> there are buddies who will remember them this way. Hard to describe, but, that, but it's, uh, you have mixed emotions, I think. And it's, uh, as you say, a very reverential uh, ceremony, serious. They don't kid around about that. Robert S. Cleaver. Here. Crew number eight. John A. Hilger. Here. Jacob Eidman. Here. Edmund B. Bain. Here. Crew number 14. Kenneth E. Reddy. Here. And Melvin J. Gardner. Here. Crew number 12, Thad H. Plant. Here. William E. Pound. Here. Waldo J. Bythen. Here. And Homer Dequette. Here. Crew number 13, Eugene E. McElroy. Here. Richard A. Knobloch. Here. Clayton J. Campbell. Here. George Barr. Here. And Harold A. Spots. Here. That concludes the roll call. It doesn't get any easier, troops. Uh, no, at, uh, re re reading that roster, uh, of course you know everyone, and as I read the names, uh, it, it really brings the old memory back, and, and uh, you, you tend to you stall out a couple of times because uh, people you hadn't, you hadn't thought of that recently or so on, and then you, you brings you back as you go down the line, and, and it gets, uh, it's, it's a real experience as far as I'm concerned. And I think whoever's doing it, 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 and the people, the other troops, they'll, they'll, we, we, we pat a shoulder and have a little tear occasionally. And sure, it's it's pr very touching because all of, especially uh, Davy Jones is having trouble yesterday, be, uh, reading off all those names of the fellows that have, have died since. One of the things that I have been able to uh, come to grips with in my own mind why I think they're special is because they were, in, in to a certain extent, the first. I mean, I know that there had been other skirmishes, there had been battles, there had been several terrible defeats, and um, of course Pearl Harbor before they took off, and I know that, um, that they 
were all volunteers and, and they said that we all stepped forward and we know historically that they all volunteered. And the, um, but to take off, you know, to practice on an asphalt runway is one thing. You get your courage built up and say, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to do this and everything. But when you're looking down 450 feet of an aircraft carrier deck and it's pitching and the weather's not great and you know that you're launching ahead of time, the plan has already changed. You're going to be bombing in daylight. If the fighters are going to see you, they're going to have a perfect opportunity. You don't know where you're going. You haven't been able to study great maps and you're, um, you've got your targets picked out. And then once your bombing mission is over, you're going to fly on another 11 hours to land someplace. You don't know all the details. And to go ahead and do it. They don't, they don't uh, consider themselves heroes. Boy, I'd like to meet someone they consider a hero. Because <laughs> I can't imagine anything more heroic. Finally, the day came when they g gave us the order to go to San Francisco. We flew across the United States. It took three or four days. We did uh, low flying most of the way. Uh, we were just skimming the treetops and the fence tops. And I'm sure we scared quite a few uh, uh, farmers. Uh, we buzz buzzed their houses and scattered a few chickens and cows en route. When we got to San Francisco, there was an order that we were not supposed to fly underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, but that made it all the more interesting for one of the uh, pilots, and he flew his crew right underneath that Golden Gate Bridge. We were supposed to be taken in around 400 miles from the coast of Japan, uh, but uh, we got picked up by a picket ship at 650 miles or something out. So at that time we had to launch the gasoline or fuel became the key problem. Uh, we knew we weren't going to, weren't going to have enough gas, but uh, we couldn't do anything about it. So Doolittle in the briefing that morning said, well, if it happens today, we have to go. I'm going to get over Tokyo, bomb our target, bail my crew out, and then I'm going to dive my plane into it, the, the nearest good target. He would have done that. There were several planes that had their pops turning. I was very careful because uh, at that time you had to sort of stop and wait until the carrier deck was level so you wouldn't fall into turning prop. I got in the airplane, they had it up to full, full speed, and and the wind was blowing across the deck so hard you couldn't hardly stand up. So we had plenty of lift to get off. Maybe an hour, two hours after takeoff, Maskey, my gunner, who was, what, 20 years old, uh, called up and he said, sir, we don't have enough fuel. I said, that's right. Click, end of story. When we got to the coast, the sun was shining, Saturday, right at noon, just a beautiful day. There's a lot of people on the beach and they were waving to us. And we're flying so low I could see the expressions on their faces, they were cheering. Because we passed over them so fast they didn't see the insignia on the bottom of the right wing. We ran into a Japanese, another Japanese airfield where they had fighters. And two of the fighters uh, came right alongside of us and I think they were trying to identify us. They didn't quite r recognize us. And they were so close that I could look them right in the face and our turret gunner started firing and he hit both of them. One of them went into a, 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 a real steep climb and started smoking. And the other sort of, uh, wobbled off, he hit both of them, but we didn't see them crash. 
my took a quick look out the other side, and there were two other fighters alongside us on that side. The crew hadn't noticed, so I tried to yell at the pilot and co-pilot, but my voice was gone. I couldn't speak. So I had to get out of my seat and went up and turned the co-pilot's head so he could see them. I think at, at the time of the, of the bombing, uh, I don't think I had uh, any great uh, feelings of uh, concern about uh, anything except bombing Japan, you know. And uh, I don't think I was concerned primarily about uh, who got hurt or who didn't get hurt. And, but we were, we had military targets and we bombed aircraft factories and oil storage tanks. We heard from the radio that uh, American airplanes had uh, bombed Tokyo. And when I asked uh, President Roosevelt where they came from, where they took off from, uh, President Roosevelt said, Shangri-La. So, but the, to the Chinese, they don't know where is Shangri-La. <laughs> Well, I think four planes ditched and 11 planes bailed out, 55 men bailed out. Sitting in the back, don't have a seat belt back there, just uh, hanging on and, and leaning uh, against uh, Bombay, the back of the Bombay when we hit. And then the first I remember came to and the, the water was rushing in the bottom of the plane. So. So I tried to get out there and finally became conscious enough that I realized we were upside down. Plexiglass on the turret had shattered and that's where the water was coming in. So I was able to push open the escape hatch on the bottom of the airplane and get out there and walk to the t tail of the plane and, s and when I stepped off in the water, the it was only waist deep so we were quite close to shore. And by the time I got up on the beach, well, the other four of the crew were all thrown out through the nose of the airplanes. So. And they were, the pilot and co-pilot were still strapped to their armor-plated seats when they came through it, came to in the water. So. Your thoughts of the moment are, are not definitive. You, you just face what's going to happen to you next, uh, next half hour. And I don't think you dwell on the future very much, at least when the thing's happening, you don't. Me in particular, my pilot was one that was executed. And I faced the same tribunal and I was ordered for execution. But somehow someone interceded and they only executed the two pilots and the one gunner and commuted the other five of us to life imprisonment. And the thing that goes through my mind is, and I don't think I'll ever get an answer. Why me? Why him? I was captured later. Some of us went back to the States, joined new outfits, and in my case, I went over for the invasion of North Africa in, no, in the fall, November of 42. And I flew for Jimmy Doolittle, who's general now. I flew for him till I was shot down and captured on Sicily in July of 43. So I spent the rest of the war in a German prison camp. Well, we wondered. We didn't know. We didn't know what had happened to them. You never know, and I'll tell you one thing. When you're locked up in a cell as big as a bathroom and you spend two years and nine months in there, the first six months you've thought of everything you can think of, and from there on out you're a living vegetable. There's, there's nothing more to think about, and I firmly feel that mental cruelty is a lot more punishable punishment than physical punishment. We crashed on uh, an island. It was in Japanese occupied territory, but the underground, the Chinese guerrillas were operating there and, and they were able to get us out of there. 
the local guerrilla leaders come to my hotel, uh, ask me if I could speak English. I was uh, uh, in the dark, I, I didn't know what happened. Pretty soon, other uh, guerrilla soldiers uh, brought in five American flyers. That was Colonel Hoover's crew of five. I began to talk English with them. They were so glad that the someone can speak English. I asked Colonel Hoover, is go to Chu Xian, which is 100 miles from the spot he crash landed. That took us uh, about 11 or 12 days for 100 miles. Lieutenant Miller, he got uh, injured, hurt on the lake. Then he's uh, six foot two. So the Chinese coolies used the sedan chair to carry him. They have to have uh, two crews. They change the shift. In Chuxian, uh, General Dulito already left. He was the first group because he parachuted very close to the airfield. Then he assigned uh, General Jones, David Jones, to stay there waiting for the rest of the crew. The torture chamber they ran us through, the way they treated us, was nothing compared to that day, today, today, today. Wondering, wondering, wondering. And I know why some of the guys went off their trolley. You have to be real firm, you have to get a hold of yourself, you have to keep something objective in mind, but it's mighty tough. Time, time is a hard thing to kill. He said to me, I'm dying. And I said, you're not dying, Bob, you're just sick. And he said, yes, I'm dying. And I prayed to my God and he's not doing me any good. Why don't you pray to your God for me? And I said, oh, come on now, you're really being a, a nerd. And I tried to bolster him up, and I think the best thing that happened out of the whole thing was the guard came over and he kept yelling at me to speak in Japanese so he knew what I was talking about, because by that time we had picked up a pretty good lingo. And I turned around and I said, oh, Bakirok, worst thing you can call a Jeff. He pulled his sword scabbard up and raped me in the ribs. It's a damn good thing you didn't have the sword out of the scabbard, I'd have got killed. And I put my fist down, it hurt, and when I drew it away, it was dripping blood. Well, I just come up off my seat and hit him on the jaw and, and put him on his back and broke his damn jaw. And I, I think that bolstered meter up more than anything else. The guards all chased around there and they were all busy seeing what went on with him. They weren't paying any attention to me. And I, I knew what was coming. I just turned around and walked back in myself. Well, I caught hell for it. I got some more punishment, but I had the satisfaction. The next time they took me out, all I had to do was <laughs> double up the dukes, and they'd back off. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek reported to the State Department and to the President the, the, the numbers of, of uh, Chinese who had been slaughtered just because they helped the Americans pass on through their villages to get to Chongqing, which was their destination. And it, until that, and of course that was not advertised in the United States. We heard an airplane fly over and it sounded like four engines and I just got to see the back end of it and I know it had two vertical stabilizers, but I didn't know what it was. And then it sounded, two days later, it sounded like uh, a couple of fighters, it might have been P-51s, because that 51 has got a sound of its own too. It sounded like a damn saw going through a green log. Boy, it was really buzzing. And then everything got quiet. And then on the 21st, I heard a commotion out in the hall, and I looked out through a little crack in my door, and here's about six or seven GIs. I could see they were Americans. 
So somebody stopped in front of my door, looked in, and he says, through the crack in the door, and he says, are you an American? Hell, I had a beard that hung down here. I could shake the damn lice out of it. And I couldn't talk. I hadn't talked to anybody for so long. I lost my voice. And fi finally they opened the door then, and he says, he looks like an American. Bring him out. So they got me out in the hallway, and he says, where were you captured? And I told him, he was a pretty good-sized guy, about 6'8", built about like uh, Shaq O'Neal, who plays for the Lakers. I said, I was with a guy by the name of Doolittle, and we bombed Japan in, on April 18, 1942. And he looked at me for a minute, turned around and looked at the rest of the troopers that were with him. He said, you want to watch him? He's clear off his trolley. Those guys were all executed years ago. And I said, oh, no, we were not. There's three more of them right down the hall here. So he said, let's go see. So we went down the hall. We picked up three more of them. The other three guys, 2 o'clock, we went back out and listened. And they, the message says, they are indeed Doolittle's boys. Weta Myers' airplane is on its way to Peking to pick them up, have them ready. He made a promise. Uh, before they took off from the carrier, that uh, when we fella, when we get to Chung King, I'm going to throw you fellas the biggest party you've ever had. Well, they didn't all get to Chung King. As you know, they lost some, and uh, some didn't. Some five went to Russia, in one crew, and some of them were still had uh, crash landed and were injured. And then when General Doolittle got to Chungking, he was ordered back to the States right away. So they didn't, he couldn't uh, carry out his promise to have a big party. After the war was over in September of 45, he wrote to every living raider and said, fellas, I made a promise. I want you to all be to my guests down in Miami on my birthday, December 1945. And that was their first reunion. The first party we held, uh, Colonel Dudo was pretty active. You know, he was a boxer and uh, he could walk on his hands and so forth. Twice during the 20s, he flew in planes that literally fell apart and he had to bail out. He was a real, uh, he, 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 had no, he had no fear, that man. When we were in uh, the McFadden Doville Hotel uh, at the first one, uh, we, he got on a swimming suit and we played follow the leader and dived off the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think got a little, think got a little wild. <laughs> Times were pretty hectic then. And they um, took over the hotel. Like the general jumping off the balcony and things like that. Uh, the night watchman almost had apoplexy from what happened that night. They took skinny dipping in the hotel pool. He'd play all night long. We would do that all night long. And, in, and uh, he wrote a report to the next man for his uh, relief manager. And he said, this is the worst night of my entire life. These people were totally out of control. The uh, manager of the hotel gave this letter to uh, General Doolittle. And he, he apologized, but the man said, uh, for what you fellas did, you can make all the noise and racket in this hotel that you want to. And that uh, was their first reunion. But he paid for it himself. And so the fellow said, boss, uh, this is a great time we've had here. Let's do it again. And General Doolittle said, well, I'd like to, fellas, but I can't afford it anymore. If you want to get together, let's do it every year. Well, of course, that was December 45. They did not meet in 46. But for any year, every year since then, except 1950 and 1966, they did not have, because new wars were going on. I learned one thing, that the, be careful what you volunteer for. <laughs> 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 the hard nuts are left. We haven't lost anybody in two years. And the, the year before that, we lost, I think it was six. 
So the guys that are hanging on now are making it very difficult for me to figure out who's going to open that bottle of cognac at the end. You know, you can't, all these guys are tough. Hopefully, uh, the two writers will be alive and will be able to attend the reunion and drink a toast to all those departed. And I said, General, what, what do, who do you think the, will be those two fellows? He looked at me and he said, I've been, I've been wondering who the other guy's going to be. Well, the last two drink the last toast, and then they turn around and bow to each other, and they both drop dead. The <laughs> cognac kills the last two. I'll tell you, some of that cognac we've been drinking would kill you. <laughs> I don't know about that bottle of brandy. I think, uh, I don't know where they're going to find two guys to drink that. <laughs> That's like saying, who's next? Yeah, and we're all pushing 90. Most of us are anyway, or have pushed past 90. We proposed a toast this morning to our comrades. There have been lots of wars since our time, and they're in one right now. And we'd like to include all our young people who are now in Iraq, who will go to Iraq, to include in our toast. Gentlemen, to our dear compounded comrades. To those who gave their all in success of our mission, and to those who have joined them since, our fondest, fondest memories, sincere appreciation and gratitude, may they rest in peace. To those who are gone. If you can't come to attention, gentlemen, you're dismissed. Get that bar open pretty quick. I need some strength. Uh, you describe it, I can't. I, um, what has happened over the course of the years, we, we've uh, really maintained a a feeling towards one another. And when we see each other once a year, or more if we have to, they're just uh, just an, uh, an affinity, I guess it is, that, uh, that's different. There's something something pretty special about these guys and what they did. I'm trying to visit all the folks and the people that were on the raid that had, were deceased. And the first thing his father asked me, well, how come you didn't die in prison camp, my son did? I don't know, but I think of those things, and I wonder what the future would have been for, for those fine guys if they hadn't been executed. I think they could have gone on, they could have all had a nice career in the service the same as I did. They could have got married, raised children. Somehow they're like sons to me, that group of boys, all 80 of them, and I'm very grateful, very grateful indeed that the good Lord gave me this wonderful family.